Jelly Bean Jen makes another video, and I will make another response to it. This one is called Feminists Do Not Care About Swedish Victims. Hello, my name is Jen. Welcome Hello. or welcome back to my channel. I don't have an intro, but I do have a story for you today. This video is going to be very sweet and centered, but I think Sweden is a good example uh, to point out when talking about feminist hypocrisy, which is something I like to talk about on this channel. Swedish feminist feminists hypocrisy. have started a so-called women's strike, this time for another Me Too situation. And I just have, I have some thoughts that I wanted to share with you today. Sure. The first part of this video is going to be about that Me Too case involving mm -hmm. Jaran Lambach, yep. a top lawyer in Sweden. Mm -hmm. If you don't want to hear about that part, but want to hear about the protest, you can jump to this part of the video. Uh, so without further ado... So I do do research in front of my videos. I'm not like, Vosh, I don't do it on the spot. We're going to do the entire video. Um, including the Jan Lambert things, because oh boy, there are a few things there that also uh, that she may get wrong as well. And also some arguments that are made on the basis of that. So let's keep going. Let's get into it. These transitions, oh my god. Jan Lambert is a 71 year old top lawyer who was recently accused of R. He was taken to court by an anonymous young woman that we're going to choose to call Jane Doe throughout this part. In this case, he was the one who chose to go public with his name and face after the media had been speculating for some time about who this top lawyer could be. The investigation into Jaran Lambach was dropped and no charges were made against him. After his release from jail, he chose to make a press conference wherein he clumsily explains himself using terms such as I was weak in spirit and flesh and I don't grope, I caress or something to that effect. I don't I'm not really quite sure how to translate the slang word that he used, but what he also did that is not being mentioned here um, may not be un may not be intentional, but um, he also talks about a bunch of uh, text messages that he had with the person who accused him of sexual assault, rape, I'm not quite sure how it was. So basically, the story is, or the account that has been given by the victim in this case, is that this 30-year-old law student was celebrating Christmas at this person, Jan Larbert's house, and they were drinking, and she went to bed with her clothes on and everything, and then she was awoken later to him, doing stuff you know to her throughout this there's been an investigation right afterwards because she pressed charges obviously and those charges were put down because of lack of evidence basically and then what this gigabrained um person does this jon lambert is he decides to hold a press conference to the media right after the charges were dropped and in those, he says a lot of yikesy stuff, including what she mentioned in the video caress. There are also some text messages that came out, including things like them both recognizing that something went wrong during the, the Christmas night, including him saying like, oh, I'm such an idiot for doing this. Uh, like, this is not okay. And a bunch of other, you know, like text messages, which really seem to indicate that, hey, you know, mm, yeah, maybe those text messages are a bit incriminating, so chances are there's going to be another, you know, wave of charges pressed again towards Jon Lambert because these text messages were released. Now, this person, Jon Lambert, has also done another <laughs> number of really stupid things, including uh, saying that he's going to uh, sue the state for holding him in jail um, while they were um, conducting the investigation, which... I'm sorry, but that that's how the criminal investigation system works. Um, I don't think you're going to win that one, Chief. Gross. He True. made himself sound like a complete creep. And he also name dropped the women who wanted to be anonymous, which is an obviously very poor taste and a shitty thing to do. Poor taste and a shitty thing to do is, is the light way of putting it, but yeah. When I first heard the press conference, and by the way, I want to add that all media removed this press conference. They listened to critique and then they removed it. But when I first heard the press conference... That's because of the name then that was dropped. I thought that um, feminists and Jaden Doe should be happy because now they can probably reopen the case because it sounded very incriminating. Uh, like he couldn't say no, like he, he, like he was admitting fault in the situation. But it turns out that feminists view this as being slanderous because what he meant was that she came on to him and he was too weak to say no which they 
say, is slanderous in nature. They obviously claim that this is the patriarchy at work. So where a man is... So he or she is misunderstood a bit about what these feminists are saying. So when they say that there's an angle of interpretation one can take from what was said by, by the, the guy. And that angle is that you can imply from his statements that he was kind of saying that, well, she was actually kind of coming on to me, you know, going back into sort of like, well, I'm the real victim here mentality, which is fairly common among people that have been accused of like stuff like this. On top of that, the reason why, you know, people talked about this as well is because, well, yeah, I mean, if you like frame it in that narrative and that is, you know, Probably not what happened, the people are going to take issues with it and they're going to frame that as like, frame that as slanderous. Obviously that makes sense. Now what Jellybean Jen seems to be indicating here is that they are doing that, they are talking about the slanderous part of it at the exclusion of the part where they can press new charges. They can do both. In fact, she could possibly press charges for both the thing that happened with the, you know, the, the, the press conference, the new things he said there, the text messages and everything on top of possible fertile or like slander charges for the way he framed the event as a whole but jellybean jen seems to frame it from like you can only do one or the other which is a bit weird i'm not quite sure what she's saying here it seems very confusing at the you know at the least but yeah just just clearing that up a little bit in nature they obviously claim that this is the patriarchy at work so where a man is allowed to speak freely whilst women are not, that men and women are not equal before the law, that this case and all other rape cases that don't lead to a charge are because men in private and men in the justice system don't believe women. So notice how in the very beginning she says that, hey, these feminists are saying that it's because of patriarchy that this is the case. And then she elaborates a bit, elaborates a bit, and then at the end, the conclusion is it's because these people are saying that men don't believe women, or men are covering themselves from women. And that's not quite what people are saying when they talk about the patriarchy. So the patriarchy influences individuals within a system to act in a certain way. So it influences men to have more sort of like aggressive characteristics, um, to, you know, to not be as emotional, yada, 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 women to be more demure, to be, yada, yada, you know, like you say, oh, yada, yada, like all these things, gender, basically, patriarchal gender roles, and how these patriarchal gender roles may play into things like, for example, rape, is, you know, fairly direct. So you might have things like, for example, the fact that there is a lot of people that just don't report this as a crime, how it in a lot of different, you know, places in a lot of different countries remains underreported compared to a lot of different crimes. Uh, reasons for this includes, for example, no trust in the criminal justice system. Uh, the fact that you may believe that there's going to be some additional action taken by the perpetrator or contacts of the perpetrator against you for pressing these charges a failure to understand or a lack of education regarding what is entailed within the context of like sexual assault or of of rape or stuff like that and how the pre like the charges can really be pressed recognizing what type of crime has occurred that it was wrong yada 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 and these are all things that are typically part of what is called you know rape culture along with things like when a lot of women are like subject to sexual assault or sexual violence of any sort. Like one of the chief questions a lot of people ask just like intuitively directly is like, oh, what was she wearing? That directly is, is part of rape culture, right? Because that sort of implicitly or not implicitly, that directly shifts blame away from the perpetrator of the crime towards the victim of the crime. And these are all different ways in which the patriarchy by itself and through the culture and through individual actors encourages the or or makes it harder for like rape charges and other crimes of the sort to be properly like run through the criminal justice system in a way that is satisfactory to us and distilling this to just men versus women is a very narrow way of looking at it as an issue and one that often you know is comes up as like a straw man of feminism in general how feminism is just about pitting men against women and treating them as like sole actors when really feminism is most concerned about getting rid of the patriarchy and the effects it has the negative ones that it has on both men and women and other people as well i don't believe this i think that this is complete bullcrap because a man does not have to be charged in court for the public to completely buy into him being a confirmed rapist and him subsequently losing his reputation and his career we've seen this with the swedish lasse kroner 
Fredrik Virtanen, Martin Temel, and a lot of men involved in Me Too scandals uh, internationally, where no charges were made, but careers were ruined nonetheless. This tells me... So what we're talking about here is a wave of like allegations that were made following Me Too, which were not sort of like followed up on, uh, or like proper charges weren't made, or charges were dropped. How does this play into the validity of the Me Too movement as a whole? The thing is that this is absolutely something that's that's negative. In some of these cases, we have to keep that in mind as well. Just because a case was dropped or no further, you know, charges were pursued, doesn't mean that the person didn't do it. Now, for the criminal justice system, 100% innocent until proven guilty. This person, th those people should not face any criminal repercussions for what they might have done. However, it is entirely possible that they might have done it and you know, by virtue of us having like free speech and the opinion to associate with whomever we like and from whichever public opinions we'd like, there is still going to be, you know, public opinion pressure on these individuals. So when you talk about the effect of Me Too and what effect it has had on society as a whole, and this is brought up as an argument, these people in, in high positions and in positions of high power being accused and then those charges not being followed up on or not landing, which can occur through a lot of different reasons, lack of evidence, people just not wanting to press charges, and some of them, around 5% of all rape charges, may be, you know, like, false in nature. But even that statistic may be inflated to some extent because of all these other confounding variables that might have to do with whether or not something is really false, it's determined that this allegation was not true, or just, like, a lack of evidence. And when we talk about this, the, you know, very wealthy and powerful people being al alleged that they have done these, you know, crimes towards women, when that's put against the benefits of the Me Too movement, being that people in general feel more confident speaking out, especially speaking out towards powerful figures, that completely pales in comparison. The fact that some of the most, like, wealthy people, some of the most influential people are put under public scrutiny when they have all the resources in the world to be able to combat that, they can press counter charges. They have, you know, like a media platform basically whenever they wanted to take against this being weighed as like a negative that outweighs all the positives that came with the Me Too movement in the form of increased people feeling like they're safe to report, um, increased people feeling like they can actually, you know, th th these people at the top of like business chains and spheres of influence in general aren't untouchable. That equation to me just doesn't line up in that sense. Now, that's in no way me implicitly saying that, okay, you know what, you know, it's not bad that this has happened because it most certainly is in the cases where those charges are absolutely false, but it doesn't happen with a frequency nearly high enough uh, to outweigh the negative effects that Me Too as a movement has, uh, has brought up as a whole. We have a culture which highly trusts women and who highly disrespects men who would hurt them not the other way around. I do agree with the feminists that the rate at which we prosecute rapists and the punishments that we give are too low. I just- So this is another, not necessarily a contradiction, but to some extent, yes. When you say previously that, oh, you know, people don't trust women who tend to be in the majority of the cases rape victims, and that actually is like, is, is distrustful of men. And then on the other hand, say that, well, you know, like rape cases, which, you know, disproportionately falls along those sort of demographic interactions is kind of like, you know, wanting to make this statement about saying that, oh, women aren't nearly as oppressed as, as progressives make them out there uh, to be, and men aren't nearly as powerful as progressives make them out to be, while at the same time kind of like insulating yourselves against systemic critiques of the way that rape and sexual assault victims are treated right now as a result of the patriarchy as a whole don't think that the problem is that men don't believe women. I think it's way more uh, complex than that. True. A rape case cannot be judged by word alone, as both men and women do lie. I think we need more resources in place to improve the way in which rape and sexual assault cases are dealt with, and I think we need to make sure women report straight away and they trust the justice system enough. And the Me Too system, or sorry, the Me Too movement and feminism as a whole has been instrumental and extremely important in assuring the goals that you're talking about here, in encouraging people to be able to speak up, in building faith within the criminal justice system, because you know that there is more of like a public pressure on these, you know, institutions. There's more scrutiny, there's more transparency in the case of these massive political and social movements. 
to do so. But the problem with Me Too was that the public were the first to know in a lot of these cases, and there was a sort of a public court prosecution, which I find unfit for a civilized society to go back once again it's weighing the like the, the public scrutiny of certain exorbitantly wealthy and influential people and how in some cases charges weren't followed up versus all of the positives that were that were like made on the other hand of the like the me too movement and once again it is wrong in the cases where those were completely manufactured but sort of discrediting the entire movement of feminism or me too on the virtue of these things that's not super uh, super accurate thank you yes, very much android sir. apex go back and add to the story with yaran lambach it turns out that this woman could be a serial accuser she has made four accusations since 2015 she is currently on trial for slander for another case and her case from 2018 is eerily similar to this one. I won't go into... I was thinking I ever... So there's a reason why she won't go into detail here. Now, number one, I have to say this. Um, Jellybean Jin, Jen links no resources or sources of the things that she talks about in her description. So I had to dig up all of this on myself, which took up the majority of my preparation time for this video, frankly. From what I have read on this uh from an, an article from expression on the topic um it says as follows the um the person pre the woman pressing charges had earlier made two accusations of rape she said four this article says two she doesn't provide a source i'm gonna buy my source in this case it's entirely wrong that this article got it wrong but seeing as this is all i have to go for because she didn't provide anything I'm going to go off this. Uh, one of them was accused in 2017. She wrote about the event in social media and described it as if it was torture. The pre-investigation like investigation about rape was put down and instead the person that was accused sued her for slander and she's now in like persecution for that. So here's an example of somebody who was falsely accused, presumptively um, or possibly, taking their legal action to push back against it. So it's not like these people are untouchable by any means. They clearly are able to push back. For the other person that she accused in 2018, he was sentenced in the court of law for rape and given two uh, years and six months prison um, for this crime. So the second one landed. The second one was completely accurate. It was proven to be valid in court. So what she says here is she says there's four people when it seems that there is only, you know, two here that's mentioned in this article on top of that she doesn't mention the one where the person was actually you know found guilty and only talks about the one where she's uh, she's being sued for slander so yeah that's another thing um that makes this a lot more difficult the fact that she doesn't refer to her own sources and then the fact that she sort of like selectively picks between uh which examples to talk about and the fact that you don't mention that this one lands when uh, when you're like framing her as a serial accuser seems pretty disingenuous I recorded this video twice before. Oh, she recorded the video twice before. Okay. I included a little bit more details about the case, but my point with this video is not. Yeah, the you should have included that detail because now I, I pointed it out, and there was a, quite a few things that you missed there that conveniently suits the narrative that you're trying to drum up. And a 71-year-old man who thinks that it's a good good idea to drink with a 30-year-old and think that he. I don't. I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't feel the need to defend himself and also he seems very keen on doing that for himself and digging his own hole so i'm gonna let him do that honestly my thing with this case is that i'm just confused as to how this this case is what would enrage feminists enough to start a women's right in sweden so I can answer that question, but she's going to go on and substantiate the point a little bit more. So I'll let her speak that and then I'll get to my point. If Greta can do it, then so can we. Sounds the encouragement on social media where feminists are now getting ready to start a new strike. This time for women's issues because of this trial and subsequent press release with Yaran Lambach. Now my first thought is how come feminists only get the idea to protest when it comes to cases involving these powerful men? Why was there no protest in solidarity with Tommy Lin's friend who was first... So what she does now is she reads out a bunch of other cases regarding examples of like sexual assault and sexual violence being employed against women, all of which coincidentally, you know, are immigrants. 
This is the argument you hear every time when it comes to social movements of this sort. How come you guys weren't talking about this when this same crime was perpetrated by a person I don't like? Why are you only talking about it in this case? And this is extremely simple. This isn't even something that needs like political argumentation, really. When an event occurs and the event is, you know, being perpetrated by somebody who has media recognition, who is exceedingly powerful, who has media influence, who, you know, just people generally like know about, and it's a very high profile case, obviously, people are going to center their support and use that as a kicking off point for their social movements, because that's what's going to get the most attention. The one she's listing off right now, are never going to get nearly as much attention as the big ones that occur between a like very popular like public figure uh, compared to these people who in most of the cases are just regular civilians that's just the cases that's how the media cycle works that's how like social movements build support that's how they rally around specific incidences you have to like sort of like weigh and take into consideration how much media attention is this going to get how much are people talking about this and from there you sort of like build your movement like from there like for example if you talk about the black lives matter and the 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 um the killing of george floyd that was one egregious example of like police you know brutality and police violence i don't know if it was the most egregious one it probably wasn't there's probably a like a handful of other cases where police brutality targeted against like black americans was far 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 more egregious why was George Floyd the one that was picked up by the media or, or like by the organization as a whole and used like as a kicking off point? Well, because it got a lot of media attention, because it was recorded in such a way that was easily, you know, easy to spread and sparked a lot of discourse. And just like that, just because that wasn't necessarily the worst case of this happening, it was certainly a very bad one, but just because it wasn't necessarily the worst case, doesn't mean that that's not like a, a just starting off point or jumping off point to discuss this issue. Same thing's happening with this, right? Because there's this very high profile person being accused of these crimes. Then what they're going to do is they're obviously going to, you know, like focus on that mostly because that's what's going to get the most attention. Then watched her friend Tommy be murdered by that same man with that same knife and was then raped again by him. I saw or heard no feminist talk about this woman. Why was there no protest when Ahmed Mahmoud was able to make a murder attempt on a nine-year-old girl in the woods on his parole for a serious sex offense towards a child. Or why not rally around this incredible woman who was attacked and raped on her way home and then had to pursue her own legal case? The man was acquitted in the district court, but after Elena on her own pursued the case to the court of appeal, he was convicted. She says that she lost everything that had previously defined her after that night, and she found no other way but to quit almost all of her courses in school. She described it as if her body psychologically almost gave up. For this So once again, you have a bunch of like three other cases which are a lot less media attention, involve a lot less sort of like influential figures, and she's saying, like, oh, why didn't these get as much attention? Well, you've sort of answered the question there through the examples you picked, right? They're obviously not gonna get attention as when a public figure, somebody who people know about, is getting accused for these crimes. This crime, the 23-year-old man was charged with two years in prison and 10 years deportation. A new study recently came out showing that 60% of rapists in Sweden are immigrants. According to Brua, rapes have increased by 44% in the last 10 years. This is what the world's first feminist government has done for women in Sweden. Because So, okay. Looking at a extremely multifaceted issue, such as, for example, why the, you know, sexual assault rates or like the rape rates in Sweden have gone up over the first year, over the past few years and attributing it solely to immigration as she tends to find this video is number one, obviously just like political, what's it called? Um, political theater. It's done to support like a, a very strong, um, like ideological narrative at the absence of having a clear and detailed look over what the real root causes behind some of these increases may be. Now it is most likely the case fairly you know obviously that to some extent the influx of people of poor socioeconomic condition is going to increase this type of crime along with many others that's how you know socioeconomics reacts with people when it comes to their ability or their um, their likelihood of engaging with crime so if we actually go to just to properly illustrate the extent that you know she will go to to sort of like 
frame this very closely into the sort of like political lens she wants you to look at through. If you look at her source, which is Biro, it, it's a, the institution that basically keeps track of criminal statistics. And this is what she's citing right here. Under the 10 years period, 2010 to 2019, the amount of reported rapes had increased with 44%. Reported rapes against women has increased by 43%. Da, 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 da. The increase under the period can be partly explained by changes in what is defined as sexual crimes, which uh, means that more crimes than earlier are being counted as rape. Uh, the definition of rape was increased on 1st of July 2013. More information about exactly what the, um, the, the change included. On top of the change in the law, changes in, for example, people's likelihood of reporting can also affect the amount of reported rapes. When you interpret the statistics, you also should think about the fact that individual reports of a large amount of like individual crimes can create a lot of yearly variation within the statistic. Here they provide three reasons basically for giving a bit more nuance as to why these statistics are as they are. Jellybean Jen just takes this first like percentage point, this first statistic, and runs with it and doesn't include a lot of the explanation that the institution that she clearly trusts enough to get this statistic from. She just doesn't include that because it doesn't fit into her like political narrative here. On top of that, a lot of the things like, for example, the changes in likelihood of reporting is something that has absolutely gone up with movements like, for example, Me Too. 100% because when movements like Me Too gain prominence and they're talked about actively in the media, more people feel confident enough to be able to speak out about these crimes that occurred. As such, you will see an inflation in the amount of reported cases of rape. And this is a good thing because more people, you know, like feel like confident enough to be able to explain it. And that's why you will see often with a lot of these, like, especially very influential people that accusations against them come in waves, right? Because you're not going to have an individual person taking on a massive, like, you know, public figure with an individual accusation because they will bury you in lawyers, you know, media outreach, media attention, yada, yada, yada. But if there's a bunch of people who all at once come at a person uh, and have all been have all been unjustly treated by them, now there is more of a backing to their movement and they feel more confident in pursuing these charges. You should include the general context, obviously, behind the statistic you're citing um, and the explanations. Um, but she doesn't do it because it's not convenient to her narrative. So yeah. Because of the politically correct culture we have here, the article in which this study is presented has to include the most far-fetched explanations. Get ready for some real far-fetched explanations for criminal activity. Okay, get ready for this. We think that part of the explanation is due to a high degree of mental health issues, drug abuse, social issues, bad grades, and so on. It can also be that a victim is more prone to report someone if the crime is committed by someone who feels more foreign to them and who has low social status. How did they come to these conclusions, I wonder? This is literally just sociological consensus. It's been there for years. The fact that having things like more social vulnerability, performing poorly in school, being more socially ostracized, having mental health issues, are all 100% socioeconomic factors that predispose somebody to engaging in more levels of criminal activity. This is just sociological fact. This is consensus. This is fairly inarguable when it comes to stuff like this. As for the reporting rate stuff, when it comes to the fact that people are more willing to like report people that are more alien to them, yeah, this makes sense. So, for example, let's say that you're like walking on the street and somebody you've never seen enacts sexual violence upon you in that situation. Now, let's say there's a different situation in which your spouse enacts sexual violence at you or to you at home, for example. Now, which of these two situations is the person more likely to report? Most likely the former one, right? There is more confounding pressures on the person reporting in the latter case. There's more pressures on a person to not report in the case that it's, for example, their spouse. Why is this? Well, they have a personal connection to that person. There may be increased fears of ramifications coming from pressing charges to what that individual, coming from them directly, or coming from other sort of like conflicting social spheres you have between the two of you. Um, you might also like by yourself suppress those memories and be like, no, that wasn't, that can't have been sexual assault or rape, right? I mean, 
you know, I know this person, you know, I don't think they wouldn't do something like that, right? And this partly stems from, again, a lack of education on what sexual assault and sexual violence is and being able to recognize it properly. Well, in the case of it being some complete stranger to you, somebody who the article describes as alien to you, you're going to be more likely to report as a police, right? There's less pressures on you not to do it. And that's an explanation for the second part. This is, um, this is, this is, yeah. I don't know how she's taking issue with this. Uh, it probably just stems from a, a misunderstanding or a, an unfamiliarity with sociological phenomena. What is this based on? So bad grades makes someone a rapist. Now, I'm pretty sure if this explanation was to be used on a white man, feminist head would be exploding. Okay. Number one, chat, stop talking about veganism, okay? Stop. What she's saying now is that she is portraying this, this bad grades example as, number one, just taking that and running with it. So what this seems to imply here from her side is saying that this is just like a monocausal thing. She's taking an extremely uncharitable interpretation of what the article was written. So the way she's probably in bad faith interpreting this as is them saying well bad grades and then her picturing that the person writing that actually believed that oh you know you got too low on your math score so now i'm going to go out and like sexually assault somebody no it's a multi-faceted issue that creates someone's predisposition towards committing a certain act if we talk about specifically the bad grades example okay what are the social effects of having bad grades well, number one, you become disaffected with the school system in its entirety. Number two, it's harder for you to get into, you know, like other educational institutions where you might do what you like want to do, study what you want to do. You're going to have less job opportunities available to you in the future. You're most likely going to be just like poorer in general. Um, as a youth, you're going to seek to sort of like other ways to form your identity around. If you're doing poorly in school, then you're not really going to care about school that much. That's not going to be part of your identity as much. You may attach your identity to something else, like, for example, sexual experience, sexual prowess, or stuff like that. And this is pretty common fountain of identity for a lot of men because of toxic masculinity, because the way we as a society value uh, men a lot based on how like sexually successful they are and stuff like that can contribute to someone's proclivity towards engaging in sexual assault and rape. It's not a monocausal thing. It's not as direct as your straw man it to be. And the interpretation that they're saying that just having bad grades will lead someone to committing these acts is extremely, like, is an extremely bad faith interpretation of what the article is saying. On top of that, the fact that socioeconomic, like, conditions, like being a social outcast, being in a socially vulnerable position, doing poorly in school, contributes to a likelihood in, in uh, engaging in crime is sociological consensus. We've known this for like decades now. She, she, there's no proof for this statement whatsoever. It's taken, uh, it's taken out of the blue. And I think it's, I think it's appalling actually. Another attempt to explain their findings away was that it is also conceivable that immigrants commit more based on the fact that they may come from a culture where women do not behave like Swedish women. They are not allowed to party and drink alcohol, for example. And then some boys, note how they say boys as well, fuck you. And then some boys can interpret it as girls who do it implicitly have said yes to sex. And she then has to relativize this. She has to relativize this by claiming that Swedish men have had this view of rape and women not too long ago. And I just want to Note, here's another thing. Once again, because she doesn't like link her sources or whatever, it's hard for me to check this. I believe she's reading from an article from Doggins New Hitter, which has a paywall. And she doesn't include the part on screen where she talks about the relativization part of it, where she talks about what she's about to mention in that, you know, Swedish men didn't hold these attitudes too long ago. But on top of that, this is extremely telling here because what was mentioned there in the article about the culture thing is exactly the type of argument that conservatives in Sweden have been going on and on and on about for like decades now. Oh, it's their culture. They're incompatible with the culture or whatever. But because the culture argument comes from a more nuanced understanding of the topic and is delineated upon in a more nuanced way, which she's, you know, uninitiated to that she's opposed to in some ways, then she, do she doesn't kind of recognize that this is the exact type of argument that right-wingers and conservatives have been making for decades when it came to, like, you know, like immigration in Sweden. And I just want to know when. When did men regard 
uh, Swedish women drinking alcohol as a way that she has said yes to sex. Because it's the so when it comes to this, when it comes to you know when did Swedish men have their perspective that somebody may have consented to sex or is able to consent to sex when they're drunk. It's a pretty commonly held belief, even among, I, I can speak from this because, well, she's not providing any, like, data on this as a whole, so, I mean, I don't have, like, the, what's it called, um, the, uh, the responsibility to do so as well, because she's making the affirmative statement, the burden of proof is on her, but even in, like, my year group, even in, like, the youth of Sweden, um, where, like, for example, I go to, like, a, like an international school, we, we're all, we're all very woke, we're all very good, we do international baccalaureate, yeah, 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 all this cool stuff. Even then, in, in, like, a pretty progressive institution, or, like, a progressive, like, educational system, uh, and in a system in which, you know, we are being, you know, brought up during the 2000s, for example, when a lot of social issues and a lot of views on social issues is a lot more progressive than usual, there are still an insane amount of people that do not understand why or that do not understand that people can't give consent while they're under the influence that's in large part why i made a video a while back on just consent as a topic and why it's important and talking about what it means for somebody to be able to consent which is this video right here because there is an insane amount of people even like you know like non-immigrant people um, which is the people that she's talking about here, which don't, who just don't recognize what consent is and don't recognize that somebody isn't capable of giving consent uh, while they're, for example, under the influence. Like I said, she, she, she has no proof for this whatsoever. And like Sweden used to be safe. Swedish women, we have a culture here where Swedish women were able to sunbathe topless without anyone batting an eye. And I mean, Sweden is known for being extremely liberal when it comes to these things. And Swedish women used to be safe, but feminists need you to not listen to your elders or your parents even. And they need you to think that Sweden has always been the way that it is today. What part of like feminist like advocacy relies on the premise that Sweden has always been how it is today? Sweden has always, just like every other country pretty much, always have issues with patriarchy always had issues with things like uh, rape culture always had issues of like sexual assault cases not being brought into light and not being like you know followed up on in the ways that they should have been you know followed up on all these things have been the case throughout history as you know in its entirety for sweden and for all these other countries as well this is not something that's like arguable really and there's no point of like feminist like there's no premise behind a feminist movement that is like okay for our arguments to succeed, we need to have people to like buy into that the rate of like sexual assault crimes occurring right now is the same as it's always been. This is not really part of like the narrative as a whole. I suppose it comes from my, a misunderstanding of what feminist arguments entail, but yeah, I don't know. Let's give me a They really want to pretend that they will be the ones to improve our situation as if they have not been part of creating the problem. All so another thing comment about this that i was just reminded of, uh, of by her saying this she doesn't propose solutions just like a lot of other people that talk about this she doesn't provide enough solutions throughout this entire video about what she believes you know is the problems are and like lumping in for example uh, like just feminist as a whole with issues relating to like sweden as a whole when it comes to integration seems very uncharitable right like you will be very careful with picking apart the different denominations within the right-wing groups and stuff like that but when it comes to the left oh they're all the same they're all just these progressive wishy-washy virtue signaling social democratic open borders communist socialist you know uh individuals but yeah all along. These protests are mainly about men's violence towards women and how feminists believe that the law treats them differently than men. I am all for criticizing the criminal justice system of Sweden and talking about these issues facing women today, but feminists will not be the ones to save us. Not with empty platitudes like the ones we see on the streets of these protests. It's the same type of demands that they always make, which are too broad, too empty, and too unspecific to implement. Men need to stop being violent. Men need to stop raping and take accountability as a gender. Abortion needs to be legal in all countries. Men need to start taking men's violence towards women seriously. The criminals should be punished.
not the victim. Change now. We should be equal before the law. And it's like, what are we going to do with these demands? And what is the government going to do with these demands? So once again, another fundamental misunderstanding of how political strategy works and how like just political movements in general take form. So you're not going to see on these like little posters that people hold up during protests do our very best through structures such as education and public institutions eradicate the forms of patriarchy within society that increase the proclivity for certain individuals to commit acts of sexual violence upon other people. That's not quite as catchy as believe women or end violence and sexual violence or hold vic or hold perpetrators accountable, protect the victims. On these posters, you're not going to get these fleshed out policy positions at all. If you want the fleshed out policy positions, you go and look at, for example, literature, arguments, articles with more like laid out prescriptions on this. You're not going to be able to understand what a political movement seeks to accomplish through looking at their boards. <laughs> That, that's what that's going to be. It's going to be the catchphrases. It's going to be the catchy bits. It's going to be the slogans. It's going to be the part that gets people riled up. It's going to be the part that's easy to chant during protests. Figure in these protests had this wonderful demand as well. That Swedish legislation on defamation needs to be changed so that it better protects women who want to use their constitutionally protected freedom of expression to tell their story. The reason that she wants this is because she herself has been prosecuted for defamation for publicly accusing a famous man of rape, resulting in him losing his career and having his character completely assassinated. He was never charged for anything, but she was charged with defamation. And I was thinking about this. She's the only woman I know who has been charged with defamation or anything similar to that after what happened during Me Too. Oh boy. There's quite a bit, you know, to say there. So, first of all, she talks about this case where this person wants to change the defamation laws. And I wasn't able to find anything on this through my research. I just got information about that specific case that she mentions previously. I was not able to look at exactly what amendment she proposes making. And that's in large part because Jelly Bean Jin doesn't let, list uh, sources in her videos. So, there's no way for me to, like, verify that and take a look at that and critique that in, in a proper way. Now, here... Afterwards, she says that this is the only person she knows of where people have like taken, you know, charges of like defamation or whatever upon somebody who falsely accused them. No, it's not. You don't believe that, Jellybean Jun. Or maybe there is some form of like cognitive dissonance double think here. Because earlier in the same exact video, when you portray the person who accused the man at the very beginning of the video as a serial, you know, rape accuser or whatever, you are very, you know, careful to include the fact that one of her allegations didn't land and she's now being sued for defamation. And just here, at this part of the video, you very it's clearly say... to that after oh, who has been... And I was thinking about this. She's the only woman. She's the only woman who has been charged she knows with defamation. That has been charged with defamation when she literally talks about it like seven minutes earlier in the video. So yeah, this is a, an astounding case of just like cognitive dissonance, and uh, and uh, in a form of double think because it it feeds like it it supports your narrative at the time. And this is an example of hey, an accusation that seems to be you know like baseless has been levied. And the person who was accused is using the proper legal channels in order to deflect this. These people are not untouchable. I think it's almost like she's just mad that she couldn't write an entire book slandering a man without facing consequences. And then she had to, <laughs> then she had to start a whole strike about it. And also, how exactly is she going to change the law here? What exactly does she want? Does she not think that... I don't know. Maybe if I would have had an article to read, I would be able to clarify that for you, Jellybean Jen. Maybe with sources next time. This will also affect women and not just men. And aren't feminists just the type to want to silence hurtful speech? It does not make any sense. So once again, um, she has she's arguing against her own straw man of what feminists is. So in her head, feminists are these 
crazy, you know, like sensor trigger happy people that just want to censor whatever is as quick as possible and just 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 censor ideas that don't agree with them and sort of bask in these echo chamber of like virtue signaling or whatever. Now, in this case where she's talking about that woman that wants to increase the uh, or, or change the definition of defamation in a way that is incongruent with the straw man she has in her head, a feminist is just wanting to censor anything, instead of re-examining her beliefs and being like, huh, you know what? Maybe this doesn't fit with my preconceived notion of what feminists are. Instead of making that connection, what she's instead saying is that this person is acting counter to feminist beliefs. And this, is, this person is an incoherent feminist. Instead of taking a look at your own beliefs and being like, you know, maybe feminism isn't all about just like censoring different opinions, but yeah. Feminists want to protect women against dangerous men, by which they mean white men who haven't taken any courses in gender studies, all while keeping the borders open, filling up with men from cultures where women are second-class citizens, and men who, like the researcher I quoted earlier said, thinks girls having fun and drinking alcohol means she's already said yes to sex and is free to rape. So, a few things here. Once again, we can't get uh, more than three sentences without stuff that I can debunk. So, number one, she says, <laughs> keep the borders open in Sweden. And, oh boy... What can I say? I, I, I wouldn't say we have exactly been doing too well on the front of keeping our borders open uh, over the past few years. Not, not quite sure about that one. This is asylum seekers specifically, but even if you look at immigrants, you will see a similar trend. Uh, just immigrants as a whole. But typically when we talk about these type of things and the type of people she's referring to when she talks about these people from other nations that, you know, don't respect women, she's talking about asylum seekers. So yeah, I wouldn't quite say we're, we're, we're keeping the borders open, uh, Jelly Bean Jen. So that's just like a, a small jab here. Now, once again, no. The complete absence of policy prescriptions coming from policy, you know, policy gen, <laughs> coming from Jelly Bean Jen as for how she would address this issue, how a non-feminist frame of analysis would work in being able to address this issue accurately. And the answer to that is that there isn't. Her answer most likely would probably be just deport these people. But I don't know because she never makes the arguments. She just critiques. And... That's a very comfortable place to be at when it comes to political efficacy and when it comes from a rhetorical standpoint, when you're just critiquing things, it sort of immunizes yourself from arguments being levied at you and the opponent is always put on the sort of like defensive on the back foot. Um, but yeah, she doesn't provide any solution for her own. So, you know what? In good faith, I'm going to provide what the feminist, progressive, intersectional solution to a lot of the issues, you know, facing um, Sweden right now, especially in this regard is. Number one, we know for a fact that one of the main ways by which people are predisposed towards committing crimes is socioeconomic condition. We must improve the socioeconomic condition here in Sweden for all people, and especially the people that have it worse, which tend to be migrant groups. Now, how do we do this? Well, I've done a bunch of research on this. I have a document discussing uh, immigration here in Sweden and the things we should do about it. And I've come up with 10 policy prescriptions that we should implement in order to improve issues relating to immigration and integration within Sweden. Policies such as, for example, uh, bringing up topics of racism and discrimination into public and institutional discourse because we have a very sort of colorblind lens of analysis here in Sweden, and there are a lot of institutions or examples within the labor market and within hiring and employment where there is stark racial and ethnic discrimination within the workplace. There is plenty of research on this. I will gladly discuss it sometime uh, if somebody would to challenge me on it. Housing. We need more affordable housing all across Sweden to ensure that we don't create ghetto societies where these people of poor socioeconomic condition are taken in and then there's a very limited places they can go uh, because of their economic status at the time. We need to just completely revamp our education system and fix it. One of the best ways by which to improve systems or improve or fix issues such as, for example, sexual assault and rape is through good education. This can be and the direct sort of like two or two year currently um, instant like integration program that we have for people who arrive to Sweden. This should generally be expanded. That's another point I have, but also through our general educational system, more education on consent, 
on things relating to just like sexual issues, gender issues, yada, 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 um, protective measures, better sex ed, all of these things would do so much towards preventing sexual assault, rape, and stuff like that uh, from taking place. So that's a very big one, the renationalization of uh, of education. Things like credential, uh, credential translation follow-ups, um, the expansion of the labor office are more things that are generally targeted towards uh, migrant groups to improve their socioeconomic conditions. Wage subsidies can also be looked into. And then legalizing cannabis is probably another good thing. Um, has a bunch of other effects, which are probably the main ones, but when it comes to specifically looking at, for example, integration through uh, uh, legalizing cannabis, you kick out a lot of the um, the base income for a lot of criminal gangs and criminal groups. And once the criminal um, sort of life becomes less profitable, uh, you're going to see less people engaging in those types of activities because the the sort of opportunity costs and the cost benefit analysis is going to be further swayed in the direction of not engaging in criminal activity. So these are all intersectional feminist ways by which to solve these issues. Jellybean Jen proposes none. The politics of the first feminist government in the world has resulted in a more unsafe environment for women, and yet feminists say that they will be the ones to change that and keep us safe. I somehow don't trust them. The Swedish justice system is broken. The punishments are disrespectfully low. The police don't have enough resources, but instead of focused criticism, Feminists will choose the men. She lays out two things here. She says police are underfunded and she says uh, punishments are too low. For the former point, I haven't seen any uh, good research indicating that it's going to have a super strong effect on the rates of, of criminal behavior uh, here within Sweden. Uh, feel free to correct me on that. I just haven't seen anything of the sort. Most of my solutions are oriented around good, proper, fixing the root cause of the issue rather than sort of not preventative, but treating the symptoms of these issues, which is what higher sentences does eventually. By heavily funding police officers, there's a lot of negatives, you know, to that specifically. There is most importantly just an inefficiency. A lot more efficient things would be, for example, properly funding public institutions, such as, for example, education and other forms of social programs, doing things like the affordable housing to break up ghettos within Sweden. Those things will do a lot more to alleviate the sort of pressure on police within Sweden right now than what just funding the police would do. It would be a lot more effective allocation of resources, basically. Versus women narrative, because it is a man-hating ideology. Feminists want us to turn against all men. They want us to be scared of our own husbands, our own sons, our own male colleagues. And here we have fear-mongering again, unsubstantiated. Colleagues and friends. But good men will be the ones to protect us from the bad men. And they don't have to take accountability for what the bad men do because they share gender to do so. Feminists- And once again, you have a reinforcement of the gender roles, which lead to things like, for example, criminal behavior and sexual crimes being perpetrated. The sort of role of men as being the protectors. We're supposed to protect women. We're supposed to be strong and women are supposed to be the protector. They're not supposed to like stand up for themselves and do their thing. It's just supposed to be the men that's protecting them from the bad men. As once again, another form of analysis, which has a whole bunch of different negative consequences when it comes to the happiness and the well-being of men and women and others within society as a whole. And on top of that, it just, um, it's, it's just, it doesn't make much sense really and it's just like an ineffective argument like strong men are supposed to protect us it's weak like come on it doesn't that doesn't sound like a policy to me just think that they speak for all women but they do not i would love for feminists to see and now she does a little hey hashtag join my feminist version thing but yeah that's my very long holy shit it's been for like an hour <laughs> critique of the uh the jelly bean gen video um yeah I mean, it's, it's about upper part. I would recommend sources. That would make my job a whole lot easier.